Now, I think a lot of sellers, they think about the end at the beginning. If you go out and you reach out to one executive, I don't care how good your message is, the chance of you getting that meeting is probably 10. You know, there's so much that you can go out and find out about what uh, makes these people tick, what makes their organizations tick. And so you use that to formulate and craft this message and everything you do from there increases your probability of getting the meeting. I don't ever have to be, thankfully, the smartest person in the room because I never am. I know I just need to know who the smart people are so that yeah. I can put them together and bring them as value. And so, man, I, I sent out a hundred requests and I just got one meeting. No, it's, it's, hey, I got a meeting. That's, I mean, that's the way that we've got to look at these. Hello and welcome to Sales Gambit. I'm your host, Ashish, CEO of Conven, a conversation intelligence platform for the sales teams. In today's episode, we'll discuss how sales professionals can leverage the art of social selling. And for that purpose, we have Microsoft's number one social seller, Carson Hedy, with us today. He is a director of health solutions at Microsoft, an eight time CEO award winner, the best selling author of the Birth of a Salesman series, and a podcast host himself. Carson has a large following, including around 300,000 people across platforms. So you can actually understand what kind of influence you would have in the sales industry. Carson, we are so happy to have you with us today. Welcome to Sales Gambit. Ashish, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited about our conversation. Sure, equally. I mean, I'll start the conversation. I start the conversation with everyone just to understand their journey, right? How did you get into this industry? And uh, what is it like today for you? It would be great if you if you, you know you can share that tips with our audience. We'd love that. Sure, I'm happy to do so. I think it's important to point out that I very much got into sales by accident. And I think that's true of a lot of people. Um, yeah. you know, I thought I was looking for a service type role and yeah. uh, I was fresh out of college and yeah. uh, wound up being in a call center. Um, it was inbound calls. I've spent time in inbound and outbound um, but I was in sales for a few years before being promoted mm-hmm. and uh, spent some time in sales management uh, in the telecommunications business, then also in advertising um, before spending time in retail and wireless. And then ultimately, um, the last seven and a half years, I've been with Microsoft. And um, looking back for me on the journey, it's really been uh, very much about relationships and resources, you know, understanding the resources and the playing field that I was in. Um, But I've been very much a student of sales. I always seek out the best practices and try to assimilate that into my arsenal. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I've worked for some large companies like AT&T and Microsoft, and I've worked for some smaller uh, consulting firms as well. So I've got a good, um, you know, broad view of of those types of elements. And uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. That's really amazing to hear. So Carson, you're not just a social seller, right? You are also leading a team of client directors at Microsoft, right? As far as I understand. And I'm sure, uh, you know, some sort of realization would have stuck somewhere in your sales career that social selling is the way to go, uh, depending on what we were seeing, right? On how things were developing. I would love to understand from your perspective, a couple of things here. What do you really mean by social selling, right? What does it really mean to you, right? And why do you think it really works? Yeah, Ashish, great questions. You know, I think the words social selling are probably overused and sometimes they get a stigma, but we're all guilty of that, right? I I say it every day, multiple times. Um, Yeah, I think the key for me for social selling, it's really, it's just selling, but it's using all of the resources at your disposal to unlock relationships that you didn't already have, Mm -hmm. to stay top of mind with these connections, acquaintances, contacts, customers, prospects, et cetera, And then also, how do you nurture those relationships over time? Um, So social is, there's a big element that is your digital brand. You know, how are you putting yourself out there from a social perspective? Um, Mm -hmm. And then also, how are you leveraging these tools to uh, create relationships that maybe you didn't already have? Um, I think it's key to point out that, you know, when I was at AT AT&T several years ago, I had a successful career without ever using any of these types of things. And then I stumbled upon LinkedIn when it came out, you know, what, 12, 13 years ago um, it, you know, and social selling like LinkedIn at the time, it was kind of this anomaly, you know, you're figuring it out. Yeah. Um, I always was very conscious, especially in the years between AT&T and Microsoft about, um, you know, how can I find ways to stay top of mind? How can I utilize these tools and, and build a community 
around what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. um, even working at a small consultant firm, that's where I really started dabbling in these practices because you know a lot of people say, oh, you, you work at Microsoft, it's probably really easy for you to get any meeting you want. That's not true. Um, but the other element is when I was at a very small consulting firm trying to meet with C-level executives, trying yeah. to stand out amongst yeah. a lot of other consultants out there, that's really challenging. So you've got to focus on uh, you know the quality of your messaging, the quantity of your outreaches, and then the consistency of your execution over time. But that's what social means to me. There's an element of your personal brand, what you put out there, and then how you leverage all of these wonderful tools to create relationships. But what you do from there goes back to sales fundamentals, people and process. Very interesting. I'll ask this question again so that, you know, we can put more emphasis towards it because I really think for audiences, it's very important to understand why does this actually work? You know, uh, and, and, and what happens with social selling as far as my understanding goes, it's, the results are not immediate, it takes time, right? So then you got to believe in it, that right? it will work over a period of time, right? So one to understand from your experience, why do you think social selling works in today's world, most importantly? I love that you pointed that out, Ashish, because I think a lot of people, they, they think that social selling has its merit and they'll go out and maybe try something, right? But it's uncomfortable. It's a new muscle that you're flexing, so it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And then you go back to comfortable ways of mediocrity or failing, you know, not getting the results that you want, which yeah. doesn't go anywhere. The reason it works, I'm a big probability person. Okay, okay. so I play, I play the odds, right? Uh, it's why I don't go to the casino a lot because I know what the odds are there. I think the key element is that you've got to look at, you know, what's the probability that I'm gonna get this meeting with the C-level executive? Now, the warmest way is a warm introduction right? Sure. That's the best. That's the ideal is if somebody knows that person and they introduce you, or if you've got a mutual connection and they introduce you, that's the best. Yeah. But when that's not an option, you've got to find other ways to open that door. And so social for me, when I focus on that messaging, again, you can only do so much. You can control the controllables. So if okay. I just go out and I send a LinkedIn connection request to an executive, mm -hmm. the chances of me getting that meeting are very small, right? Sure. However, if I put a nice personalized message, I put some reasons why that meeting would be valuable to them, not a laundry list of what I think is great about my product, but yeah. if I put a reason why I can add unique value to them yeah. uh, or some yeah. perspective that's gonna be unique to them, some voice that's gonna be unique to them, that's what's gonna enhance my probability of getting that meeting. But here's the other thing that a lot of people don't understand about social is that mm -hmm. if you go out and you reach out to one executive, I don't care how good your message is, the chance of you getting that meeting is probably 10, yeah. maybe 15%. True. But True. if I swarm all of the influencers of that one individual and I start building some momentum within that organization as I'm prospecting and I start developing mind share, uncovering what keeps them up at night, that yeah. is all going to give me a very powerful voice when I finally do get that meeting with that executive. The yeah. biggest deal that I've ever yielded from social selling, um, several tens of millions of dollars, was basically a direct result of reaching out to over 500 people in an organization. I was able to connect with a few hundred of them. Mm -hmm. um, I met their president on day two uh, mm -hmm. prospecting via mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And over time, just continued to prospect, continued to water that garden, those are the key elements and that's why i keep going back to quality quantity and consistency it works because you're going where your audience is mm -hmm. you're finding them on a social platform you have all of this intel at your fingertips research you know there's so much that you can go out and find out about what uh, makes these people tick what makes their organizations tick and yeah. so you use that to formulate and craft this message and everything you do from there it increases your probability of getting the meeting once you're there obviously mm -hmm. you've got to bring your resources to bear you've got to develop that relationship but social can get you in the door in a way that few other things can no that's true and it's amazing how you you know reached out to 500 people across an organization a very interesting question, Carson, that I really want to understand and differentiate, you know, that uh, that imagination in the uh, mind of our audiences is when did you actually figured out that social selling is what I should focus a lot more on? Uh, I mean, was there a point in your career or the realization that happened that, OK, let's go with social selling, let's put more effort on it. Uh, and, and how did it start? If you can give us some background about it, that would be great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
You know, I think where I would really say it began for me was um, I was at a small consultant firm yeah. and was attempting to set up conversations with C-level executives of small businesses. And, um, you know, I was coming from it from kind of a management consultant or sales consultant type of lens. And, you know, the goal was just trying to cast a wide net. Um, you know, here's the thing, like, you never know, again, if you reach out to one or two or five or 10 executives, you know, your chances of getting that response are relatively low. It's kind of like applying to a job. If yeah, I go out to true. a job board, it's very easy to apply for a job on a job board, but it's got diminishing returns. I can go out and apply to five, 10 jobs, and I may think they sound perfect for me, but guess what? A thousand other people think the exact same thing. A sure. thousand other people are reaching out to the exact same executives that you're reaching out to. So your odds are very, very small of even getting noticed. Um, in fact, I would encourage you to do research on, um, there's often C-level executives are interviewed on what it takes for sellers to get through the door, why they do respond, why they don't respond. Go out yeah. and research some of those types of things. Yeah. Um, but where it started for me was trying to I had no brand at the time. I was just a kid working at a consultant firm trying to get meetings. And so um, I had to really focus on offering some unique perspective, which in my case was the sales and leadership experience that I had developed in a previous role at a Makes previous sense. company. And you all have that. Everybody listening has a unique superpower. You have some type of passion that you can parlay into value for other people. And I discovered long ago yeah. That fortunately, mine is how can I orchestrate relationships? How can I create wins for customers, for my colleagues, whatever that looks like? Um, I don't ever have to be, thankfully, the smartest person in the room because I never am. I know I just need to know who the smart people are so that yeah. I can put them together and bring them as value. And so when I started working at Microsoft, I mm -hmm. took the exact same approach. I started building a community around what I was doing. Rather than aggressively selling, I was trying to create value, uh, create newsletters, webinars, things yeah. that events, things that would bring people together, get them thinking about us, our business and and just establish that brand as a trusted advisor for them i've even recommended competition uh mm -hmm. before when it was the right thing to do because i just wanted to earn the right to be their trusted advisor they knew they could go to me because i would reply i'd be reliable and i would give them the right guidance and uh, that has served me and my teams very well um, over the last several years makes sense makes sense let's say i mean you know Till then we have till now we have really understood what social selling means how why should people agree that it work right and how they can think about themselves on to start a social selling thing or not uh, but as businesses or as sales people right how do you conclude what platforms do you go or target for social selling uh, is it a, is something that takes a lot of uh, brainstorming or it's very clear with your current ICP that you're trying to go after? What is the case for you in general? I love that question. And I think it's key not to overthink it. Um, you know, social selling for me is a mechanism. You know, you don't just use one tool. You really hit on something there because you don't just use one tool. Okay. And I think the key for me has been, first off, you do, you have to understand the value that this can bring. Um, you know, I, I think, who among us is 100% satisfied with our results today, right? Um, do you have all of the relationships with your customers or within even your own organization that yeah. you want and need? Yeah. And that's how you've got to convince yourself, yes, yeah, social selling is the way to go because I need to go out and create these relationships. And so once you've made that decision, you've got to think about where are these folks? Where am I going to find them? Now for me, and this is not an endorsement because yes, obviously I work for Microsoft, we own LinkedIn, um, not an endorsement, but I have used LinkedIn a lot over the years in Sales Navigator. I, it gives you this amazing uncanny ability to go out, look by geography, by organization, um, by you know what company they work for, what business unit they work for, what their title is. There's so many different ways you can kind of slice and dice that. So for me, that has been a very helpful tool. Now, internal to my organization, and this has been true of every company that I've ever worked for, you likely have some type of CRM tool. Yeah. You might have some type of marketing insights or leads that are coming to you. You know, yeah. again, for me, it's about probability and prop, you know, propensity. So if, if I've got a warm lead coming in, I need to prioritize that because there may be a 
15, 20% chance of getting that meeting as opposed to the usual 5%, right? So look at some of those inbound leads or people that are in your CRM. When I started working at Microsoft seven and a half years ago, there was a litany of people that had made purchases at even our local store. And uh, they were ripe for building that community and starting to invite them to events or you know, just trying to figure out what, what they were endeavoring to do, how we could add more value to that relationship. So um, those are warm leads because they've already done business or they've already engaged with us in some way. So look to that as well. Think about where are your clients? The other element is, you know, I subscribe to a lot of, you know, whether it's business journals or industry trade papers. Um, you know, right now I'm in healthcare. So there's a lot of these that I try to consume um, and I solicit people, um, you know, for ideas on like different trade papers because you've got to have a unique voice and a unique perspective. You know, you need to be able to go to a client and say, hey, you know, everybody in our industry right now is being challenged by supply chain. How are you broaching it? Would you like to hear from some of our experts who can talk about what we're doing with other organizations of your kind? And that gives you a better probability of success because it's messaging. So think about the people that are going to care about the unique value or the unique experience that you are going to bring. And think about what mediums you can find these folks on. Um, so for me, it's it's there's a lot of different tools for that. Um, you know, we've leveraged a lot of these tools and there's a lot out there, so I don't want to alienate any of them, but there's so many out there that will take organizations, give you company sentiment, right? So it will give you uh, like a nice list of like key words that have been pulled out of their their annual reports, or um, it will give you some of the key buyers, right? This information is so valuable because then you can go out to LinkedIn or you can pick up the phone and you can call and, and you can do all, any and all of the things that you do to prospect. It just gives you uh, better, higher value prospecting because you've got a better probability of getting the meeting. But um, I think businesses pick the tools for social based on a litany of reasons, but you've got to put top of mind, where are these people? Where is my audience? Um, you know, I leverage LinkedIn, I'll leverage Twitter, I'll leverage Facebook in some instances, um, just depending on how can I find these folks? How can I find out what makes them tick, what matters to them? And then how do I learn more about their organization? So be very intentional about picking tools that are gonna show you those things. Got it. So what you're really saying is that before even finalizing or zeroing down on even one platform, it's very important to uh, understand where your ICP really lies. Then, then understand what kind of value they need and then go after them, right? So it's not just about one platform. It's about what really, where really your audience is and what really ticks with them, right? Is that correct? That's it. I, I mean, look, you, you always go back to how do I make the most quality messaging? Mm -hmm. So that's going to come from the research and understanding the, their playing field, right? Yeah. Understanding their motivations. Then the quantity of outreach. Um, yeah. You know, again, that's the probability piece. It's, you know, I, I grew up in the call center game. So, you know, it was all about the dials. But I, when I got into management, for me, it was about quality dials. I didn't care if you made 500 calls in a day. That didn't mean anything to me. If you made 10 really, really good calls, that's all that matters. I, I had my team count quality calls. Um, and so I think those are the key elements. And then last, consistency. You've got to do this over time. Schedule intentional time every week. And it's not as much as you think. I'm not out on LinkedIn for hours a day. It's probably maybe an hour a week uh, that I'm actually out on LinkedIn doing prospecting, but do it consistently over time. You don't go out and gar water your garden once. Uh, you've got to continue to do these things over time so that the process can work. Very interesting. And I, though I think that you have touched uh, all the aspects of selling, let's say prospecting, then reaching out to them and then starting a conversation and then nurturing, right? Let's say these are the four major steps of how you you know, kind of uh, start selling, right? But it would be great if you can deep dive into this whole process. Uh, for our for the ease of the audience, let's take LinkedIn as an example, right? The best social selling platform out there for me, right? Uh, you can make a lot of connections which are valuable. People are there for networking, right? How does the sales representative who is very new go about these four steps, including prospecting, reaching out to the people for the first time, starting a conversation for the first time, and then nurturing them over the period in time to really make that case. Uh, how should they go about it? Yeah, um, a, a valued mentor of mine uh, told me, your network is your net worth. And I wish I had figured that out very early in my career. 
So that's the first thing that I would say to somebody starting out is really be diligent about creating relationships, both in your organization yeah. um, and but and investing in those relationships. Like how can you add value for other people? Always be thinking about that. But it's the same thing with customers. Social selling is a means to an end. It's just a way to create relationships that you didn't have otherwise. That's it. Um, sure. So for me, it's been, you know, I've got to think about the audience. Like if I'm a seller and you're listening to this today, go out and list off 10 relationships that you need or want, whether it's from your career standpoint or your your role, um, your prospecting, and then go get them. And, yeah. and that's the key for me. Um, I like LinkedIn because I can go out and I can cast a very, very wide net. If I reach out to 500 people, guess what? Chances are a few hundred of those are going to accept. I mean, sure. and that's why it's, it's all about quality messaging too. You can hit send connection request and yeah. your chances of them actually accepting are maybe 10, 15, 20%. But if you send a personalized message, I'm up to about a 45 to 50% acceptance rate for every first degree connection request that I send. And that's because I send a message every time that I believe it has the highest propensity of getting a reply. It doesn't every time, but it gives you a higher probability. So uh, going out and creating those relationships. So, mm -hmm. and there's LinkedIn automation tools that are out there too. I personally, I wish I had discovered some of these years ago because I did a lot of this work manually for mm -hmm. several years. Now there's tools that are out there that will automate some of this. Mm -hmm. Now I caution you, you've got to be very careful about using some of those because you don't want to sound super, super templatized. I mean, that's, and look, I've done a lot of these things. I've made mistakes with it. Um, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. That's the key thing is the first step is, is acknowledging that you're not where you want to be from mm -hmm. a results or relationship standpoint, because yeah. that's what forces you to make the change and say, look, I'm going to do social and I'm going to commit to it. You can't just go out and stick your, stick your, your toes in the water. You've got to do the flying cannonball leap in. And then of course you tweak it, um, you know, as time goes by, but you know, it starts out with LinkedIn, you know, find your target audience. I use sales navigator. I go out, I look by, you know, if I'm looking into a specific customer account, you know, maybe I'll, I'll zero in on that account look for titles. And I think about plays, right? I mean, we're in the sales game. We're thinking about sales plays. What is the right messaging for this group of people? You know, you're not going to necessarily send the same message to the CFO that you send to the uh, chief HR officer, sure. right? Sure. Um, you're going to change that uh, for some of these folks. So think about the campaigns that you want to run, the conversations that you want to have. I've also utilized surveys. Um, you know, I've sent surveys as part of my social outreach uh, to some of these folks to say, hey, these are some conversations that my team is very, very well versed on having that we have a unique perspective on. Which are of interest? Which would you like to collaborate with us on? And see what comes back. The key is just getting that conversation. And I think a lot of sellers, they think about the end at the beginning. But yeah, I just want to get a conversation. I don't know where the conversation is going to go. They may not have anything that we can do together right now. But guess what? Here's another reason why social matters. If I invest in that relationship, I am top of mind. They see my posts from time to time about things that are going on in my organization. Yeah. And then let's say they either enter into a situation where they need me or my organization. Sometimes they even go to another company and now they can do business with me. You never know where that relationship can go. That's the beauty of life, the beauty of relationships. So for me, I look, for, I use Sales Navigator, I find my audience, I send them some messaging. If they accept, I usually wait a few days so as to not look too opportunistic and eager. And then I reach out again and ask for the meeting. And, um, you know, again, that's why the probability element is so important because if I reach out to 100 people, chances yeah. are I may get 40, 45, 50 acceptances and new connections. But of those 50, probably only three to five will take that first meeting that first time. And it's not out of malice, people are busy. So yeah, that's why you give yourself the highest probability of success. And the other thing is a mindset thing. Mm -hmm. I look at getting three to five meetings that I didn't have as a great thing. So if I had to reach out to a hundred people to get them, so be it, great, sign yeah. me up. You can't look at it as, man, I, I sent out a hundred requests and I just got one meeting. No, it's, yeah. it's hey, I got a meeting. That's, I mean, that's the way that we've got to look at these. So for me, that's where the process is. And then once they are in that process, now you've got them 
create newsletters, create webinars, create events, invite these folks. I've had situations where it took every bit of two to three years mm -hmm. before some of these people that I was prospecting, creating relationships with, even engaged with me. But guess what? They turned into deals. Right. Deals are a product of relationships. Don't focus on getting the deal. Focus on getting the relationship. And if I have to really ask you, right, this is, you might have seen this debate all the time, right, on LinkedIn. Uh, when someone accepts your request, I'm diving deep into LinkedIn as a, you know, platform to do social selling. It is most uh, easily available and, you know, a lot, lot of people use it already. So let's say somebody has already accepted your invitation, right? Do you immediately reach out to them? Or how do you go about reaching out to them for the first time? Do you make sure that the first time you reach out to them is really, uh, they have already noticed you before you reach out to them? Uh, there is a debate going on. I'd really like, like to understand your perspective about this thing. Yeah, it's a good question, Ashish. I, it really depends on the situation. Okay. Um, you know, if it's, let's say I'm taking on a new book of business, right? And I, I, I'm sending outreach and I mean, it's in this, in this situation, I mean, it's pretty much all greenfield, right? Because it's, you know, it's a, it's a target rich environment. I have no relationships. Um, so if I'm reaching out, somebody accepts, I may send them something pretty quickly to ask for that meeting. Uh, now, if it's another situation where maybe I'm in, in experiencing some blockers, um, maybe I've had an account for a few years and I'm trying to unlock some new relationships, I may have a little bit different messaging because I may have some intel that takes me into that. Um, I, you know, And I always say like, don't overthink the situation, pick your strategy and execute. Um, you wanna be mindful of, you know, all of the situations going on in that account. You know, I don't wanna go in and like be a bull in a China shop, but yeah. at the same time, I want to create relationships and I wanna be very intentional about that. So um, I think you, you think about what is my strategy going to be for this follow up for this response, send that follow up note. Um, I, I, I encourage people not to overthink it because again, the probability of getting the reply or getting the meeting may be low. Um, now, if you come in with a great vantage point, like you've already swarmed all of the influencers and you can say, hey, I've talked to your you know, CFO, your COO. He says, I need to talk to you. That's going to give you a better chance of getting that meeting. So you probably want to be more mindful the higher the probability is of getting that meeting. But if you're swinging at something that has a low probability of getting a hit, um, you know, I don't think you need to overthink that element. I used to lead a call center several years ago. And, you know, I had people that would prep for these calls for like 30, 45 minutes before even calling, and then nobody would answer. And they would never talk to these people ever. It was just this cold calling environment. And yeah. it blew my mind that people would prep for 30, 45 minutes to talk to nobody. So mm -hmm. I think the key element is think about, you know, don't get to a point of diminishing returns, pick a strategy for this follow-up, send it, execute, move on. And if they reply, great. But if they don't, don't wait around. It's the same adage of if you're applying for jobs, like just because you've had an interview, you don't stop applying to more jobs. You've got to keep feeding that and yeah. see what comes back. The dream scenario is you've got five offers at the same time and you've got the tough decision of picking between those five, right? Um, the key element is you don't wanna stop uh, just because you've gotten one reply or, or whatever and think too much. Don't overthink it, pick a strategy and, and execute. Very important. I think what you're saying is that rather than thinking about overthinking about it, we can look into data just like we do for all the other mediums and, and then continue what we want to do and keep on tweaking that part, right? To get more and more out of this data set, right? So it's like act, acting like a funnel actually. Now, I totally agree with that, Carson. The next thing I am, uh, you know, which is very closely associated with this is uh, let's say you reached out to someone and someone said, no, they're not interested. We all know that in B2B sales, no is just for time being, right? It's not for eternity. It just means that you are not the fit at that point in time. But uh, then you got to nurture the prospect. You got to keep them in loop to reach out to them later, right? How do you execute it at your end? How do you keep those prospects in your funnel, keep them nurturing so that you can, you can later reach out to them and see if there is a fit at that point in time or not? I love that question. And, you know, here's the thing. If they do actually take the time to respond, it means they read what you said. Yeah. It just didn't resonate today, like you said. Um, and I, so I think the key element is, you know, if, if they're permissive to doing this, maybe you add them to a newsletter that you send, okay. maybe you invite them to events and, and webinars and things of that stature. Or if you see an article, 
mm-hmm. or an announcement or something that you believe would resonate with them in that space, um, mm-hmm. or you want to ask for their unique perspective, or you have a relationship that you could create that you believe would benefit them, even mm-hmm. if it doesn't necessarily fit into selling something today. Yeah. Do that. Um, I met somebody, you know, a few months back, and it was one of those situations where I don't think either of us saw an immediate synergy where we could just jump in and do something together. However, um, I knew some things that were near and dear to her heart as far as, you know, what she did in her in her role, but yeah. also in, in the broader community. And so I was able to create a couple of relationships. And, and guess what? Those types of things resonate. You're always making deposits, right? You're always investing. It's kind of like a stock portfolio. Yeah. It's the very same reason that I pick several different platforms to use to do social selling and selling mechanisms. True. Because you never know which one's going to work. There's no silver bullet. So if you invest, though, statistically speaking, if you invest in stock over time, over a period of 20 years, you leave your stock and your money in a diversified portfolio, you're like 100% guaranteed to make money. And I think that's the key element that how we need to look at our relationships. You keep investing. You don't know how that investment, if that investment is going to pay off. Um, We are in this instant gratification mindset a lot of times, and that's not how this stuff works. Um, a lot of sales cycles run years, right? So we've got to be very cognizant that if you see an opportunity to invest in a relationship, take it. And, you know, over the, over time, it'll pay dividends. Very interesting. I have this one question, you know, that I have been wondering all the time, right? And uh, I'm a student of social selling, right? I try to learn it myself. I'm not good at it, but... Uh, as someone who is in sales, I would really love to know, is there a framework? Is there a fixed process that you might have discovered? Some fixed step that I do every day and I go get become better at it? Is there something like that that you have discovered and you would want to share with us, which makes it all easy for us? Yeah, you know what, Ashish, that's probably the best question of the day. And I think, look, I don't even purport to be good at social selling. I don't. I you use are. it and I believe in it and I've been because of results that I've gotten from it. When I started doing this, everybody looked at it like it was an anomaly. They're like, oh, you know, Carson's just playing around on LinkedIn. Everybody else is talking about all these meetings they're having and Carson's playing around on LinkedIn. But when I started to get results that I could speak to about it, Mm-hmm. And then I started being asked to train it and coach it elsewhere. And then I started being asked to train it and coach it globally and film training about it. And then I was named like the top social seller in a global company like Microsoft. It, it blows my mind. I mean, I'm just a small town Midwest United States guy. Like I have no, there's no, I have no business being, um, you know, you know, recognized for what I've been recognized for. Just do something. You know, identify the areas. If you apply the framework of what we talked about today, yeah. and you have that at the core of your strategy, and you schedule intentional time to do it, like mm-hmm. just schedule half an hour a day. You know, break. If you agree that this is a good strategy, why would you not spend some of your day doing it? So schedule no, half an hour of your day to start out and do it. And maybe one day it's a post. Maybe you make a blog post. Um, you know, maybe the next day you go out and you find 50 contacts and you send them a connection request on LinkedIn with a personalized message as to why you believe you could add value for them. Um, if you get one person reply, cool, you know, like reply to them and send it and 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 have a meeting and meet new people. Like it's, you've got to like, like anything, there's, you know, you, you've got to take some baby steps and yeah. you've got to agree that the process is something that you want to invest in. You've got to figure out the parameters and the playing field first. Like, don't just necessarily go out there and just start goofing around and like doing something with, with no no method. Um, but agree on what you think your process should look like. Figure out where your audience is, how you want to reach out to them, how you want to stay top of mind for them. Um, because like, for instance, I've got a lot of contacts that I've made that I don't talk to every day or I, maybe some that I haven't even talked to. But guess what? I may be posting something that's provocative or thought provoking. Yes is industry related that they may see and they may engage with and yeah. you can't you can't see or control like what they're going to do from there there's a lot of ways that you can track uh what you're going to do right so uh, you know maybe open up an excel spreadsheet um and you know keep keep in mind what are some of the key kpis that i want to be driving out of my social like how many messages did i send how many outreaches did i send and a lot of these automation tools they'll keep that stuff for you but like think about like how many people did I reach out to today? Um, you know, how many meetings did I get? And then don't just abandon the process because you reached out to a hundred people and nobody like took a meeting with you. Tweak yeah. your process. 
Focus yeah. on the messaging. Because again, you can control quality, quantity, consistency. Focus on the things you can control. And if you agree that this is a great process, it will pay off over time. I, I totally agree with that, Carson, right? That, you know, you somehow, uh, when you start doing social selling, I mean, the effects are unlinear, right? You can't see an instant gratification all the time. For example, when you see send the email, you know how many emails have been delivered, how many of them have been opened and how many of them you have gotten a reply to, right? But here, this is not something like that, right? You might be writing a content that's very useful for your target audience, but you don't know if you're going to get someone from that content piece and the time that you have invested in, right? So this is totally not linear, right? Uh, in a salesperson's mindset, this will always be a concern, right? On how do they divide their time between social selling and the other things that they have to do, right? And no matter how much we tell them to not think about the results, but the mind is calculative, it will always think about the ROI, right? How do you suggest people go about that? I do understand that it can't be measured and it should not be overthinked. But do you think that there has there is some metric to it, something that can measure the impact of social selling and tell us that, OK, this is the effort I'm investing. This is what I should expect. Anything like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm realistic about this. So I knew very early on that I needed to show dollar signs. I'm in sales. I needed to show dollar signs to be able to indicate, hey, this is working. So yeah, yeah. Um, it was after the first multi-million dollar deal that came as a direct result of meeting somebody on LinkedIn where, hey, there's a the great story here, right? But you can't also be a flash in the pan. You've got to deliver results over time. True. True. I can look back at my career and I think I'm up to about 15 deals that originated on LinkedIn that would not have happened without social um, that total hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. So, you know, that for me is a great story to say, look, obviously social works. But the key thing for you, like when you're starting out is, mm -hmm. you know, make it boil it down to what you can track and what you can control. I can control these elements of how many messages that I send. So like focus on the process and fine tuning the process, getting meetings. Mm -hmm. Where does that meeting go? And then tracking some of these things over time as well, right? Like, you know, if I'm connected to somebody for three years and, you know, they finally start showing up to like these webinars that I'm doing and then lo and behold, I get a meeting and then lo and behold, like we're, we're talking about some great things that I'm bringing in my team, you yeah. know, we're planning the possibility of doing something together. And then, you know, we, we get those milestones in place for a deal and the deal happens. Um, I mean, none of these things, like to your point, I mean, they don't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, so I think the key element is focus on that next step first, um, mm -hmm. rather than focusing on all the big deals, the big deals will come, I, I promise you. Focus yeah. on how do I get these meetings first? How do I make my process so crisp that mm -hmm. I get these connections and I get these meetings? Because if you're getting meetings, and then obviously it falls down to sales process, right? How effectively are you navigating the meeting? Are you getting that next date, right? Those are the key things that you need to be thinking about, but focus on that next step of the process, land one step at a time and you know, perfect that social process so that you can create a relationship. And then also think about how you nurture it. What's your regular touch point? What's your, you know, how do you do a quality touch without always reaching out, trying to say, where are we with this or this next step in the sales process? No, it could be they see an article that you post or you yeah. invite them to an event or a webinar, you send them a use case or a case study, right? Yeah. Um, there's so many different ways to engage people. Just be mindful of that and think about the probability that it's going to impact your customer. So what I understand is we can tell uh, that we can tell any sales people that uh, you should start with small time allocation to social uh, along with what the regular work that you're already doing. Just be mindful of what is working, what is not, and then slowly decide a sweet spot for you on how much time, how much effort you're going to put it into social as versus other mediums as well. Is that a correct understanding? And, and people can gravitate themselves. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. It's hard to it's hard to give an exact answer to that because here's the key thing. Just like when you get a big quota, yeah, you might have 50 accounts, you might have 10 accounts, you may have one account. You've got to gravitate toward where am I going to hit that quota, right? Sure. So with social, you know, you may go out and I like I may block off an hour or half an hour to go out and start doing social stuff, but then I get a reply. Yeah. from my biggest prospect, you better believe I'm going to drop everything and yeah. I'm going to address that. You've got to gravitate toward the highest propensity to meet 
to right. connect and buy. So, you know, I'll go out and I'll do these prospecting activities and I'll be very diligent about scheduling time for myself to go out and prospect. However, you've got to gravitate toward what's going to get you paid, what's going to get you the meeting. Um, and when there is a live active person who's ready to talk to you, you've got to go in that direction. So, um, schedule time to do it because it's a valuable activity and you've got to continue to create relationships but uh that other element is you know gravitate toward the people that respond makes sense totally agree with that and i think i know that's definitely a hard question to answer in exact ob- objectivity totally understand that uh lastly i always end podcast you know all these podcast and beautiful conversations with some reading recommendations and and you are a best selling author yourself right so do you want to quickly give the audience just about your books and uh what they can learn from them and how they can grab a copy yeah um no thank you for that you know the books for me have been a um it was a lifelong dream but uh it's it is what opened up the opportunity for me to talk to people all around the world yeah. um you know i i challenge everyone to think about again your unique superpowers and how, you know the what's the messaging um what's the impact that you want to have and for me like that's what enhanced my social following and enabled me to talk to people everywhere about sales and leadership and things that were near and dear to my heart yeah. i'm i don't people are surprised by this i don't read a lot of the leadership and sales type books i read constantly but i usually read you know fiction or biographies and the reason why is because i want to be inspired you know i'll reach a i'll read a biography about john wooden or michael jordan or, or somebody that inspires me um or even elvis like a story that captivates me i read a lot of spy novels as well i'm a big james bond fan i i like the escapism but i also like to be inspired and motivated to to improve myself and so i try to create a a, a story that wasn't just a sales book or a leadership book first off because that's been done so many times and so well i might have had i knew i couldn't compete in that space so i picked an area where i could find a unique voice imagine that that's what i think everybody should do with their personal brand um but i created a novel mm-hmm. about a fictional protagonist who has these experiences and then he writes a sales book so it's a sales book inside of a novel about a fictional protagonist who has a a spanning career um the last one was salesman on fire it's been by far the most popular um and i think what people will glean from it is how can you approach the the varying steps of your career and your life with the most profound impact how do you start how do you maintain and how do you continue to reinvent yourself you know that's one of the things that we're talking about now these social selling tools weren't around uh when i started in my career in selling um you know and i've been in environments where we were tracking uh calls on excel spreadsheets right um now you know we've got very sophisticated tools we've got to we've got to adapt we've got to modify we've got to be chameleons it's like a doctor um you know not adopting new surgical methods that enhance the probability of success right uh, we've got to do the same thing so that's what the books are all about very interesting carson and that's all the questions i had for today thank you so much for coming on sales campaign and sharing such amazing insights with us Really. Ashish, the pleasure was mine and I love the name Sales Gambit too. That's a great name. Uh great conversation. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the uh thoughtful questions and uh best of luck to all of your listeners. If they um you know have the have the wherewithal to reach out, I'd love to connect on LinkedIn oh. and continue the dialogue there. Thank you. Thanks a lot Carson. This is your host Ashish signing off. See you in the next episode.